well, uh, and uh, we and uh, we we continue our uh, our conference with uh, not not so very rails way, and now we are back to the rails way, uh, and uh, the next talk is about database sharding. Uh, do you remember? Uh, my question about uh, the code sources, Mexican code sources. Uh, I think everyone who was trying to start uh, the database in Rails also know the pain in the ass. So our next speaker is about database sharding. Okay. Hi. Hi everyone. Um, Finally, you survived uh, the last talk, and uh, I promise I'll try uh, not to burn your brains. Um, and actually, I want to apologize in advance. I, I have a cough, so I could be interrupted several times in my speech. Um, my name is Vitaly. I'm a tech lead at uh, Talkable. Um, I've begun using Ruby back in. Uh, 2012, uh, when Rails version was on the 3.2. Uh, actually, I I felt like I have to add all my social uh, accounts here, but I'm I'm not very social active person. If you uh, check out my GitHub account, you barely find something interesting there, because I'm almost uh, not into open source. And uh, uh, my last uh, Twitter message was uh, about I don't know, selling spare tickets to Yeruko, because we have to. Uh, speaking about Yeruko, uh, it's finally the time when I met Matt in person and uh, I could take a picture with him and include in the slides also. Uh, also, I'm a, a much a runner. Uh, I have uh, finished four marathons uh, so far, and now I'm in uh, preparation for my next one this, uh, this fall. Also, I'll, uh, I'll have a run tomorrow morning uh, along um, Sea Beach, and if anyone want to join, please welcome any pace, any distance, it's okay. Uh, okay, it's enough about me. Uh, let's start speaking some interesting things. Uh, in uh, this talk, uh, I'll try to start a little bit about scaling, the concept of the scaling. Then I'll um, switch to database sharding. And during all the slides, you'll see uh, a lot of uh, different diagrams and almost almost no code. Uh, does anyone of you remember? the site canrailscale.com ah, please raise your hand <laughs> not many of you I, I saw it was more popular uh, it was a, like a single page application like a literally single page application that uh, very uh, in an understandable way explain and answer this uh, question uh, this domain doesn't exist anymore but uh, I was able to pull it from web archive and it was look like this. <laughs> uh, everything uh, started when uh, Twitter uh, began experience a uh, problem with, with their load when uh, they started growing very fast and they couldn't uh, handle the load and they just admitted and remark that uh, Rails doesn't scale, period. Uh, also, a uh, few months ago, there was a topic on the uh, Hacker News where the people were discussing um, different trends in uh, programming languages and uh, deciding what uh, language they should do. Uh, choose right now in order to handle uh, big load. And one of the user uh, defending Rails uh, said that uh, twi Twitter scale wasn't so much a Ruby or Rails problem as it was in relation database. 
and uh, I share uh, the same opinion and uh, during our talk I'll try to convince you as well. But uh, before this I would like to start a little bit about theory and uh, about scaling. So what is scaling in general? If you compare scaling with uh, performance, so performance is just a quantifiable measure of your application. How fast it could respond, how many requests it could process in uh, some period of time. But uh, scalability, it's a capability of maintaining the same performance when your application grows. And if you, if you take a look at this chart, you'll see, so if application uh, scales well, then it's able to keep the same performance. When it scales poorly, the performance drops. And uh, what exactly capabilities we have to scale? And actually, there's not many. Uh, you could uh, increase the computer, uh, compute power of your instances, or you could just uh, add more instances into, into your architecture. Uh, this, uh, these two methods, also known as uh, vertical and horizontal scaling. Um, let's start with some example. Uh, let's imagine you have uh, some Rails application where your web workers, the database, are running on the same instances. Uh, suddenly you realize that it's not enough, you need to a bit increase, increase its power, uh, you're doing vertical scaling, maybe you introduce some background in, into the application, then it, again it's not enough, you increase uh, in computer power, and again it's not enough, you increase the computer power, and then you realize that it's, you can't do it anymore, you need to introduce uh, horizontal scaling. And maybe the first step, you just uh, extract a database from, from your instance. Uh, then you see that extracting database, you could also extract your background jobs, also in separate instances. Uh, now you are doing a horizontal scaling. And by introducing uh, some load balancer, you could uh, add as many uh, web workers or background job processor servers as you, as you wish. But actually, actually, it's not it's not true. And uh, let me tell some true story from uh, our talk about project. Uh, when during a spike in a load, uh, we experienced some delay in the job processing. And uh, when all the jobs, uh, all, when the spike was gone and uh, all the jobs uh, were processed, we uh, we found like a low priority queue with uh, about 100,000 jobs in uh, this queue. It, this, these jobs were like a, almost not important. Everything they do is just touching some, some model in your database, but there were um, a lot of them. And we decided, um, let's just add uh, one more instance to process these jobs, not to care when they uh, finish, and we saw the situation. Wow, our database instance was completely under load and we were like one step from, um, from the downtown. Uh, that was the first sign that um, database needs scaling as well. In, uh, in database scaling, uh, first thing that came uh, in mind is, is replication. Uh, you could introduce some slave replica and perhaps uh, this kind of uh, scaling uh, you have on the early stages of your application. And also you could have this replicas as many as, as you want, but it not solves uh, the problem, for example, when you have to read exactly after you save the data. For example, you did some create action and then you have to show. You can't wait until the, this data appears in some slave replica. So, data has to be sharded as well. Uh, and what is, what is sharding? What is the database sharding? Actually, it's a very simple, simple concept. Uh, it's kind of 
uh, horizontal uh, scaling as well, where you just um, split your data in a, um, smaller, uh, smaller chunks that are um, easier to manage, that are faster, and and that's all. So just just split your just split your data, but but how? How to how to split? And there is a several several approaches how to do it. Uh, first uh, is is a functional. Uh, you split your data exactly. You split your tables depending on uh, what modules you have in your application. For example, in, uh, if it's um, uh, such kind of microservice architecture, or you have uh, independent uh, um, independent modules modules in your application, you, you could have uh, different databases. Uh, in expressional uh, approach, you uh, split the data by some expression. For example, you could store all the data from 2017 in one database, from 2018 into another database, or, for example, um, data from uh, America in one and data from Belgium in, in second one. Uh, these two, these two methods uh, has own uh, disadvantages. For example, you you're limited to the number of of charts. You can't have um, more uh, instances, more database instances than uh, the modules you have in your application, or than more instances than your business doing. Your business is doing, and uh, the third one is is more general generalization of uh, database sharding. You need to have some metadata which uh, associate, associate every row in your tables with some particular shard, and you have to you have to maintain this um, this data um, somewhere. It, it it could be some. Uh, know, separate uh, separate service like a data of copper or something like that. Uh, that was that was like a very quick uh, theoretical part of database sharding, and then let's let's start thinking about practical part. There will be some uh, some codes there. Uh, for example, uh, if you if you choose um, functional uh, approach in sharding, you could easily uh, do it out of box in, from your Rails application. You just uh, establish connection in your model and it, uh, and it use uh, own shards. Also, you have to take care about, uh, about migration uh, and uh, as it's promised, perhaps these this methods of uh, sharding will be available by default in the sixth version of, of Rails. Uh, if you if you started using expressional or metadata approach in sharding, you need to manage your connection to your databases. And uh, hopefully there are several gems that are already doing it, for example, Octopus, Rails sharding, or Active Wrapper Shards, which we are using uh, in Talkable. And uh, in general this these games just gems does uh, give you some interface where you could specify context uh, when you're doing your request. Uh, I would like to, um, to tell you how we do sharding in Talkable, and uh, perhaps all of these steps are required for you as well if you if you want to introduce sharding in your application. Uh, first question that appeared is how to shard. Uh, should we uh, use functional, expressional, or other way? Um, because of the business domain of our application, it was pretty obvious that we have to share by customer. All the data are related. Uh, all the data that are in our database is uh, belongs to some particular customer, and we could easily like split it by by the customer. So it's kind of expressional plus uh, some metadata management. The next question that uh, appears is which tables have to be sharded? And uh, the answer is uh, it's pretty obvious, it's like a, it's the largest. Uh, we should shard the largest tables. Uh, some of some of uh, our tables are uh, about billions of records. 
and uh, it was pretty obvious to start with them. But uh, then we start thinking, um, okay, this tables has association with other tables, so perhaps other tables has to be sharded as well, and then other and other and other, and then we see like, a, oh my gosh, it's like a, all the tables has to be sharded, but uh, but this lines of sharded and not sharded uh, tables has to be drawn somewhere. Uh, for example, you you don't need to shard your users table, something like that, because you uh, you will not know how to even log in the user in the PS system. And uh, thankfully again uh, to the business uh, process we have, business domain, uh, we could easily split uh, the data by some kind of configurational data. It's relatively small uh, tables and, uh, and referral data. It's a really huge table that came from, from the user, from the public. And when we, when we made this decision, we, we came up with other problem. Uh, if you see here, like a, this is two, two different instances. Previously, it was like a one database, and uh, you have a, like a lot of uh, different requests that are joint tables from this, in this instance and this. And now you can't do it anymore because it's different databases. So you have to get rid of all joins that are. Uh, were in your application before. And we came up with very um, straightforward idea. We just parse all the queries uh, that were existing in uh, our application. If uh, there is any uh, tables in the same query from sharded and unsharded uh, databases, raise and, and rewrite your write a code. So it's a um, joint detector. And when you when you get uh, when you got rid of your of your joints, uh, you actually have to introduce the connection management, and it's exactly the part when uh, when you need to start using gems. Uh, you have to um, specify the context in your controllers. You have to specify the shards in, into your module into your models. Uh, you have to specify the context when, uh, when you're making some requests in a console. And, and perhaps to achieve all of this uh, connection management, you'll need some utility helpers, like uh, um, check what the current shard is, uh, what uh, sharded tables are, um, or even like execute a query on all uh, all shards of this uh, method that helps you specify the context in your in your console. Uh, all of all of these uh, helpers um, it depends on how you how you introduce this connection management into your application, and only then you have like the finest part. You have to migrate your your tables. Um, this, this migration uh, should or even must be uh, as, as much gradually as possible in order to avoid uh, um, countdowns in your, in your application. Uh, you could, you could uh, use benefit of uh, your database, um, first uh, like split the tables between the different databases inside one instance. Um, and, uh, Right now we we have like a this this situation. So we we extract a separate shard. It's a second shard, and we have the the same the same shard uh, and uh, not sharded uh, tables in the, on the same instances. So the next the next steps is uh, to have like this situation when you have completely extracted your. Um, your sharded tables from from the main uh, main instance, and when you when you complete when you complete all this uh, all these migrations, so you have your you have your database sharded. And what I was what I was uh, describing here, it it is kind of in-house solution. Uh, perhaps if you if you have like a hundreds of database instances in your application, you, it would be 
completely is a mess to manage them. And then you have to start using maybe some particular solutions. Uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL uh, has them. Uh, I'm not into uh, them very much because I have never tried it, but at, at some level uh, you, you should start, start using something like this. Uh, in conclusion, in conclusion, I want to I want to say that by introducing sharding into your application, uh, of course you uh, will have these smaller parts of uh, your data that definitely uh, easy to manage and they are much faster than uh, some completely all the data you had before, and perhaps you even reduce your costs, but. Uh, Start doing sharding and implement it in your project. It's it's not uh, uh, it's not easy uh, easy stuff, and it's very hard to, to implement. And actually, you, you have some lost abilities like uh, like the joints. Uh, I would also suggest uh, a few a few things to you that please do not start doing uh, shard uh, just at the beginning of your project. Uh, start doing it. At the moment when you really uh, feel the need, you in in sharding, and uh, and choose the sharding uh, approach depending on a business model of your application. Perhaps uh, functional sharding is it's enough for you, so just stop on it and, and and use it. And also take in mind that every time when you uh, introduce. Uh, new instance in your architecture, you just increase the chance of uh, random crash. So when you when you had a one database instance, um, the chance that your database corrupted is very low. But when you have like five, ten, or, or more, it's it's growing. And uh, the most important suggestion: uh, please go with me tomorrow for a run. Uh, it's eight a.m. at uh, uh, at the moment uh, of um, a known sailor, uh, and it doesn't matter how fast you run or how uh, far you want to run, we could we could do like one kilometer, one mile. Thanks, and uh, I have to say, like uh, if you want to uh, start uh, working with a database that are sharded, we are hiring. Thanks. Uh, we are using uh, Active Record Sharding by Zendesk uh, and we choose it because out of the box it supports sharding and uh, uh, slave management together. In a, in a database YAML you could specify uh, SEO shards and also the slave instances uh, with it. That's why we choose it. Uh, my question is, uh, do you set up shards on your local computer, on your local developer computer, in order to like, see the production? Yeah, but it's it's not different uh, instances, it's just different databases in one MySQL server. And you must do this, right? Yes, yes, in order like, to perform some tests. So does a shard basically um, the same, only you segment by data with different databases? So you don't have to worry about table names and stuff. But you take a subset of your original database and put it in a new database. Is that what makes sharding value? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of sharding as well. Uh, anything that you 
uh, when you split your database, in the database or your data into smaller parts, is sharp. Okay, so the, um, when you showed the, the, on the first slide or something, <laughs> on the first slide you said something like, um, if you, if you separate by, by a table into sub-tables by country or by ID modules or something. So that's also sharding. Yeah. It's not, it's not the hardcore sharding the way you show it, basically. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's also sharding, but it has uh, own uh, disadvantages, like uh, if uh, some particular year has uh, like a huge uh, amount of data or some particular country has a huge amount of data, it doesn't solve your general problem of uh, splitting the data. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, the, the other question I have is, um, the joins, so you said, I mean, obviously you can't join between different databases. So um, at Talker, for example, how did you find out what you can uh, separate into a separate database? Did you just look what kind of models have no associations, or how do you uh, figure out the things? Uh, first, we, uh, we draw the line between um, uh, here, like uh, we decided which tables have to be sharded and which tables are not. So we like I say like okay, tables users uh, not sharded, tables on visitors are sharded. And uh, by having this information, you could uh, check all the queries you you have in your in your application. And uh, if these tables appear in different uh, shard, then then it's that's a part of the functionality that has to be changed. Okay, so if you use the, uh, if you move the visitor table, for example, to the shard number one, you also move all the associated tables? No, of no, no. We just, we just rewrite the functionality in order not to join them. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Thanks. Customers and new customers uh, upload new data into your uh, database. And when you have these two um, uh, two situations simultaneously, it's like a O n square of your complexity. Your database uh, growing very fast. So by extracting uh, new customers into new databases, we make our main uh, database chart growing not so fast, like linear uh, growing right now. So that was the main point of uh, introducing chart. Okay. Because, because like uh, as I said, some of the tables uh, uh, have a billion records and it's really, really complicated to, uh, to make any requests in this amount of data. Okay, and uh, what? What time of request currently uh, in general? Uh, it depends what, what you're doing. Uh, if it's just, uh, I don't know, refining something by primary case, it's faster not uh, having any shards. If, you, if you're doing some, uh, I don't know, uh, accumulating request, you want to count number of records, so you want to uh, aggregate some, uh, some data, this requires good to, to like seconds. Okay, uh, and uh, also I have a question. Uh, why, why not to use uh, such uh, tools uh, for performance measure, like uh, near, uh, for example, tools for performance measure, Neuralink? Uh, maybe you know something about that. Or uh, techniques uh, such as log editing, uh, other stuff. Um, we use in our project Neuralic for performance measure, but uh, uh, I don't understand what was, how it's related to this topic. Uh, I just 